And I think we are live. So good morning, everybody. I see a few people in the chat section already. And today we are talking about provisionism, demon possession, and wisdom. Now today, it's going to be, uh, could be, could be quite an interesting day today. If you, uh, if you drink coffee, I highly recommend you get some. If you need energy pills, eat your Wheaties, take some focus factor, whatever you need. Today could be rough. Uh, maybe not, though. Don't know. Never can tell. We're going to talk about provisionism, demon possession, and uh, wisdom, the concept of wisdom. <clears throat> so, if you like what you see here, we invite you to support the channel. We're 100% completely viewer-supported by people like you. If you like this to continue and to continue ad-free, um, the details to support this venture financially are in the description below this video. So, welcome aboard for that. Um, I also want to say in the comments section, I'm constantly scouring the comments section, trying to find good comments to read in here. And I would, um, there's, I know, I understand we haven't even started yet, and there's already some chat back and forth about like where people live and things like that. And that's, I, I think that's great. Not a big problem with that. But from here forward, if we could try to keep it on topic, it'll help me better select comments that are relevant that we might be able to read during the show and bring into the program because I don't uh, I don't have <laughs> I don't have somebody selecting comments for me at least not yet I kind of have to do that on the fly so provisionism demon possession wisdom and acts 16 now without further ado as James White would say let us get into uh, the book of Acts and go to chapter 16. <clears throat> and I'll show you what I want to talk about, and then we'll get there in kind of a roundabout sort of way. So what I'm interested in talking about is this damsel here. And it came to pass in Acts 16:16. 16, 16, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, because remember Luke is with them now, because he's the entourage, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And then they get in trouble for it, okay? Uh, they get uh, the rulers of the town, the masters of the girl who are making money from her. They get upset and then they go throw Paul and Silas in jail. So let's back up a little bit and look at where we were last week. Um, what happened last week is they met Timothy. <clears throat> Their, Timothy comes on the scene here. And this is the Timothy, as far as we know, that is the recipient of the books, First and Second Timothy. And this is the Timothy that is allocated as, or appointed as, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And there is a, there is a strong Ephesus theme throughout the New Testament. Okay? There's some very key information about the church that is found in the book of Ephesians. There's some key information found in the books of 1 and 2 Timothy. And um, it shows back up in the book of Revelation as well. Okay? And even for this channel... Huh, even for this channel, we, we base our, I guess, our motivation to try to, our, our modality of edification comes from Ephesians 4, 13 through 16. And in Acts chapter 20, Paul talks to the Ephesian elders before he goes to Jerusalem and gets thrown in jail. And there's some key information there. So there's this, uh, I, I recommend that when you read the, the New Testament, that you kind of have a, a heightened sense of what is in, through, and around Ephesus, because that's, it's interesting. It's very interesting how that flavors the rest of everything else, right? So, uh, Paul takes and circumcises him, and we looked at that last week, and we compared that with Galatians 5, how Paul denigrates circumcision. They just got through with Acts 15, where they find out that you don't have to be circumcised, or keep the law to be saved. And here he takes Timothy and circumcises him. So on, 
from one perspective, it could seem that the statements being made and the actions being taken are kind of contradictory. It could be taken that way, all right? <clears throat> and then as they went through the city to, de to deliver the decrees, we talked about that last week, those letters that came out of Acts 15, and they're trying to establish the churches. And when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And they were come to Mysia, and they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Okay? Now, isn't that interesting? There's a, there's a song I want you to think about. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. <clears throat> and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man in Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we, we, came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and then from thence to Philippi. Now, interestingly, Paul gets this vision. They go to Philippi, and spoiler alert, if you've read the rest of the chapter, you know they get thrown in jail. So you can imagine how Silas is... Uh, kind of new to this missionary stuff. Silas is with Paul because remember they used to it used to be Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement about Mark, so they split ways, and then Barnabas took Mark, and then Paul chose Silas and took off. Now here they go. Now they're getting this forbidding of the Holy Spirit to go to a certain place to preach, and Paul gets this vision to go to Macedonia, and then they go to Philippi. What happens in Philippi? They get thrown in jail. They get thrown in jail. Like, so you can imagine Silas is like, you know, people are doubting the veracity of Paul even today. Even professing Christians do. So you could imagine Silas thinking, I don't know if this was such a good idea <laughs> to, to uh, I don't know if Paul knows what he's talking about. Did Paul really get a vision or does he have some kind of bias or whatever? I don't know. What's going on here? You don't know what's going through Silas's head. But we don't get uh, we don't get a anything explicitly told to us about that. But you can imagine perspectively in the shoes of Silas what might be going through his head. They came to Philippi. Now that song, this song, send the light. <clears throat> send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, something, something forevermore. I don't know. And then it, one of the verses says, We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. What is the Macedonian call? This is the Macedonian call mentioned in that song. It is this idea that there's, hey, there's this guy, a vision immediately we... Um, there's a, a man of Macedonia praying, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And then we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel to them. And so there, the, we have heard the Macedonian call today. In other words, I have uh, this strong sense that I need to go preach the gospel here, right? And then the song says, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. We have this idea in Christianity that we should be preaching the gospel to everywhere, everyone, all the time. But, if you look in the context, if you look what just happened, what happens? They're gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. In other words, don't go preach the gospel there. And after they were come to Mysia, and they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. It is not the right, proper thing to do to preach the gospel everywhere all the time. Now, I can't necessarily tell you what the answer to that is, but I believe that if you are led by the Spirit, you will get a sensation that sometimes now is not the right time. Sometimes here is not the right place. That sort of thing. I see J God Missions down there in the comments saying, Hey Kevin. Hey J God Missions, how are you? <clears throat> so 
uh, even though the song says, you know, send the light from shore to shore, well, not here. No, not in this case. There's, there's places to not send the light right now. Why is that? I don't know. It doesn't say. The text doesn't say. Now, in your situation where you are, you might be able, you might have a sense of why. When you get, you can use wisdom and sagacity and assessing the situation to determine that maybe now isn't the right time. Kind of like Jesus said to somebody, I have many things to say unto you, however, you cannot bear them yet. You might get the, you might get the point that a particular audience is not ready for what you have to say. And then you make a decision that you're either going to hold back or not engage in that way or not engage at all or something like that, okay? And maybe you will know why, maybe you won't. The text here doesn't necessarily say, although we do know that in 2 Timothy 1, Paul says, all they which be in Asia are turned against me. Perhaps they were already turned against him and uh, he was going to be killed or thrown in jail. I don't know. So they loose from Troas, they go from city to Philippi in Macedonia, and on the Sabbath they went out of the city by a riverside. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Lydia because I have a whole entire other video about Lydia, but we will point out a couple of things and then we want to get to the passage we want to focus on today. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Want right here means something that tends to happen almost as if it has a mind of its own. Okay, It's what tends to regularly happen as a regular routine. Where prayer was wont to be made. So, uh, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. Now a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Now, isn't this interesting? Most of the places they go, they go down to a synagogue first. And they preach the gospel to Jews first, then to the Gentiles. Kind of like Romans 1 15 to 16 says here they're going to a place where people are tending to have a prayer meeting down by a riverside and uh, they're talking to the women it's, it's a it's kind of like a a break of the normal mode of operation the normal mo that paul has <clears throat> nothing wrong nothing right or wrong with it just interesting to point out to me um now there was a Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. Now, city of Thyatira, we, we don't know much about Lydia. We don't know if she is a Jewess, a Jewish proselyte, a straight-up Gentile, but it says she worshipped God. It does not say she worshipped a false god or worshipped God falsely. It says she worshipped God, okay? And what is she doing? She's going to a prayer meeting by a riverside. So she's worshiping God and going to a prayer meeting. Now, a Calvinist will say, well, look, whose heart the Lord opened. This proves that God has to open your heart before you can attend to the gospel. There's so many things wrong with that. What else could it prove? Right now, we wouldn't talk that way because we're not stupid. Okay. But what else might it prove if you want to talk stupidly? It might prove that maybe you need to worship God and go to a prayer meeting if you want God to open your heart. You see? You see how many different angles there are? There's an infinite number of ways to interpret passages. Two great examples to disprove total depravity, in my opinion, are Cornelius and Lydia. Okay? Um, Calvinists are pretty good at following a formulaic script and throwing a whole bunch of passages at you to prove total depravity. They need total depravity because their entire system cascades from it, okay? Now, so when they see this, they're going to try to preach total depravity. And you can use, you can use Lydia and Cornelius to show that these people are praying and worshiping God, and in Cornelius' case, giving alms and fearing God, all before they hear the gospel. Now, so this actually is a, is a disconfirmation of total depravity, okay? So, <clears throat> so, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Now, what's the second problem with this? We don't know what Paul said here. 
We don't know what Paul said. We don't know if he preached the gospel. We don't know if she was already saved. In the chart that I have, where's my chart? In the chart that I have of um, the gospel presentations and the conversion accounts given in the book of Acts, I have this one coded as yellow. Right here, Acts 16. Already believed. I have it as yellow. Because with Lydia, I'm not sure. I don't know if she already believed or if she's getting converted here. It does not say. Okay, It could be a case like with Apollos where they're already a believer but they have the way of God explained to them more perfectly. could be something like that. There's some people in Acts 19 who have never heard of the Holy Ghost but they had the baptism of John and they seem to be believers in the Messiah. Are they saved? Are they hearing the gospel? Or are they just getting the Holy Ghost? You see? Uh, the text doesn't tell us any of that. And so for people to infer, when you start with your dogma and you go to the text with your dogma, you can infer anything. You can in, there's, when it comes to Calvinism, there's obviously, if you're not a Calvinist, it does not take a rocket science to figure out how the text has to be read if Calvinism is true. Anybody can do that if you already know what Calvinism is. The fact that Calvinists can generate an explanation which aligns with Calvinism doesn't mean a cotton-picking thing, okay? All it means is that they already know the ideology with which the passage must align if Calvinism is true. And you don't have to be a Calvinist to do that, okay? Anybody with two brain cells can do that. You probably don't even need two full brain cells to do that. And when she was baptized, what kind of baptism is that? Doesn't, don't know. And her household, she besought us saying, if he have judged me to be faithful to the Lord. Now, how on earth could they judge her to be faithful just based on her hearing whatever Paul said and then getting baptized? Faithful is a... We detect a, a pattern of faithfulness, a pattern here. So how could they ascertain a pattern of faithfulness if it did not include the fact that she was already worshiping God and already attending prayer meetings? So when she says, if you have judged me to be faithful, it seems to me that it would include the pattern before she encountered Paul of already worshiping God, already going to prayer meetings. So, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass. So, I guess they did judge her to be faithful to the Lord, which to me indicates something prior. They're, they're ascertaining or discerning or inferring a pattern of faithfulness before they encountered her. Because I'm sure they talked a lot and exchanged back and forth. Hear a little bit about our past and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and it came to pass as we went to prayer. Now that's, so that's the Lydia thing. Okay. And Lydia is this, this fact, the fact that this passage says whose heart the Lord opened, that Calvinists jump all over that because they, they desperately need something to prove total depravity because their entire system depends on it. Their entire system is optimized for around the presumption that total depravity is a thing. And so they scour the Bible looking for that thing so that the rest of the erector set of the cascade of doctrines that flow from total depravity can have a proverbial leg to stand on, which they don't. Okay, There is no total depravity in the Bible, not any verse. Ca context and Calvinism never go together, never ever, not one single time, ever. So, some J. God Missions says, um, good morning, happy to be here, be blessed. When you get a second, I became aware that many provisionists believe that you can lose or give back your salvation. Just curious what your thoughts on that are. No rush, I have to head out, but I'll be back to watch the video later. Um, you'd have to talk to the individual person that believes that, okay? I, I do not understand that to be the official stance of provisionism. 
as a thing, but it's interesting that we're going to talk about that a little bit now. Cliff says, I'm not so sure Silas was discouraged since the kingdom gifts of the spirit was still operative until we see Paul after about AD 55 leaving Timothy sick or Trophimus sick. There was some dispensation overlap. Now, Cliff, I hear what you're saying here, and <clears throat> but you are assuming cessationism and a certain understanding of dispensationalism on your comments there, okay? And you're reading them into whether or not Paul Silas felt discouraged, um, apart from what the text says. So if somebody else does that and we can point that out, we should be able to point it out when we do it. And I say that from somebody who... Uh, not as probably hard and fast lines as a cessa- as a cessationist, but more or less um, have always had that perspective that he's putting forth right there. <clears throat> so now what do we want to do? We want to look at this text in Acts 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, verse 16, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. I mean, she's demon-possessed, so she's telling lies, right? Because the uh, spirit of divination following Satan, Satan's the father of lies, so he, she, that's a deceptive statement, isn't it? Looks like the truth, isn't it? And this she did many days. Yeah, Cliff, I see you. He didn't seem discouraged singing in jail. I, I got you. Got, got all that. So, and this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now what follows next is the masters that saw the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them in their marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. That's a pretty rough place. That's a pretty rough place to be. <clears throat> Ruckman used to always say that uh, he, he had this imaginary thing that he would talk about where if you imagine all the preachers of the association sitting around talking about the gospel and whatnot, they'd all be talking about what makes them, what legitimizes their ministry. And they'd all be sitting around drinking coffee and eating donuts and wearing these uh, nice fancy white shirts and ties and coats um, and talking about how many people they baptized last week and all that kind of stuff. And then Paul would come in there and the proof of his ministry would, he, he'd come in there all dirty and beat up and bleeding. And uh, he would point to his body and say, I, he would say something like, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There's proof of my ministry. <laughs> something like that. <clears throat> so, this uh, damsel is possessed with a spirit of divination which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, I need to, I have an allergy issue, so pardon me just for a second. So somebody in the comments section said, <clears throat> on a recent Remnant video, I objected that there is no necessary connection between dispensation and cessation, but they do seem to coincide. See, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get us away from this kind of ideological type thinking. I'm trying to get us to first principles thinking and not to just judging or assessing uh, the overlap or underlap of different existing formulaic doctrines, doctrine sets, worldviews, reality tunnels, whatever you want to call them. Mimetic constructions. <clears throat> so what's going on here? 
What is wrong with this statement? What is wrong with this statement? These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Is that statement right or wrong? Is it, a, is it the truth or not? These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Wouldn't you want somebody telling, wouldn't you want as many people as, the possi as possible pointing toward the truth? Wouldn't you want that? Okay. <clears throat> now you got to think about several things here. So this grieved Paul. What grieved Paul? What grieved him? Was it the fact that she was saying something wrong? No. No. Now, why do I mention this? Because recently we've been doing videos, our FSI discussions, and I encourage you to get on my channel, search my channel for uh, like the terms free grace theology or term provisionism, FSI discussion, provisionism. We've had some discussions about free grace theology and provisionism lately. And people are trying to understand. Now, Roberta has a good point. Good message, bad messenger. It's a good point. That's, it's, that's one of the places we're going. Exactly right. So <clears throat> people don't understand like, I'm looking at this statement of faith, brother, and I don't see anything wrong with it. And this is the exact same kind of thing going on, okay? I'm looking at free grace theology, and we're making these statements, right? And uh, is there anything wrong with the statement? Sometimes there is, but let's say there's not. Not necessarily. Let's say you're looking at a statement in, in the provisionist statement of faith, and there's nothing wrong with that particular proposition, okay? Um, do we still have a problem with it and why? So it's not just whether the proposition is right or wrong. And I can't, I can't seem to get people to get that, okay? It's how the thing is generated. It's where it's coming from. It's the source of the information and the propensity for the information to overtake people in a way that overcomes their own sense making and causes them to defect on their own sense making and become an NPC for a separate video game. Now we constantly talk about Calvinists being NPCs. What's an NPC? It's a non-player character. Say you're playing a video game and you go up to a character that is built into the game. It's a fake uh, AI person that isn't really a player and they either give you a message or maybe you have to fight them or something else but they're just running off a program they're not a real person they don't have their own thoughts and feelings now when you play games online sometimes you come across other players and they that icon that avatar that you see really does represent another person that's making their own decisions within the game and they're <clears throat> they're not constrained by the programming of the game or restrained uh, to certain programming. They can uh, try different things, exercise their own volition, if you will, in certain ways. So it's like, it's like um, when people move from Calvinism to provisionism, it's like going from being an NPC in Dark Souls to being an NPC in Zelda, okay? It's, it's really no different. You're still an NPC. It's still a problem. Now, what is this here? <clears throat> she cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What is that? That is a proposition. That is a proposal. She is proposing that these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, if she is proposing that. What do we know about propositions? Propositional knowing. What is a proposition? Propositional knowing is only a symbol or a pointer that must point to one of the other three kinds of knowing in order for it to be valid. The real knowing is participatory knowing, perspectival knowing, and procedural knowing. Now we've been over the four kinds of knowing many, many times on our channel, and we have a video with um, the professor of cognitive science 
from the University of Toronto <clears throat> from back in September where he came on the channel and he explained the four kinds of knowing. This is not a new thing that people are inventing. This is already how humans have al always already operated. These are reflective of the different uh, developmental stages put forth by people like Piaget and Kohlberg and Erickson and whatnot. You develop, you start off with participatory knowing, perspectival knowing, and the procedural knowing, uh, the, the ability like to throw a baseball or to know how to pass a bill through Congress, procedural knowing, to know how to do something, all right? To know how to throw a baseball. Could you describe propositionally exactly what's happening when you throw a baseball? You could say, well, I'm <clears throat> moving my arm to sling a ball toward an object. Well, how are you moving your arm? <clears throat> What nerve impulses are going throughout your body? What muscle fibers are you constricting? Can you really describe that all the way down to, the, to really say what's going on? You know, you could write a thousand pages about throwing a baseball and never quite capture exactly what's happening when you throw a baseball. So, propositional knowing. Perspectival knowing is knowing uh, somebody else's perspective, being able to ascertain as many other perspectives as possible and bring them all together so that you can get an optimal grip on a scenario. Like if one side of the ball is blue, one side of the ball is green. When you are a toddler, if you're looking at blue, you think the other person is looking at blue too. But when you get to a certain stage of development, you can ascertain that if you're seeing blue, then they must be seeing green. You get a different perspective and you can understand someone else's perspective or a perspective from a different vantage point. So getting a different perspective, multi-perspectival, is not contradictory perspectives. They are supplementary and complementary perspectives, all right? People think doctrinally, if you get someone else's perspective, that you're necessarily compromising or getting something that contradicts the truth. No, you're getting more parallax, okay? You're getting more cameras on the thing. Participatory knowing is the deepest kind of knowing. And when you're, when you're trying to apply for a job and the job description says must have 10 years of experience, what is that saying? That they are saying that we need you to have 10 years of participatory, perspectival, and procedural knowing in order to be qualified to do this job. That's what they're saying. <clears throat> and so when we say this, all we're doing is breaking down those, it, it helps us, um, we operate this way all the time anyway. So this just helps us to break down the kinds of knowing so that we know what kind of knowing we're dealing with. When you're dealing with a proposition like this damsel makes here in Acts 16, these are the servants of the Most High God which show us the way of salvation, any kind of proposition is necessarily data compression. It is not the real kinds of knowing. All it can be is a symbol that points at one of the real kinds of knowing. That's all it possibly can be. It cannot be the real thing. If I say the word baby, those phonemes that come out of my mouth are not a baby. They just signify a baby to you because you know to interpret that into your participatory experience with what a baby is. And you could say that for anything, whether it's a swimming pool, a tomato, a whale, or a hamster. You have some kind of participatory visual, whether you saw pictures or something, that when, I, when those phonemes come out of my mouth, they map to something participatory and perspectival or procedural for you. All right? If I talk about how to throw a football, you probably have thrown a football. And so you have something procedural to map that back to. Now, if I said that to... Uh, say a Russian who didn't speak a lick of English, those phonemes coming out of my mouth would mean nothing. They would mean nothing. Um, which goes to show you that when the propositions are made, the only way they can mean something is if the other person can fill in the gap and the compression and the lack of context and data with participatory knowing of their own. And that's what I'm counting on, right? If a, if a Navy SEAL talks about Navy SEAL training to another Navy SEAL, they're going to have a lot of participatory shared knowledge. But if you try to explain Navy SEAL training to a 7th grader, 
they are not going to be able to communicate on the same level. They're not going to be able to communicate on the same, uh, they're not going to understand the same jargon. And so you're going to have to vastly expand the propositions used and simplify them in order to communicate to somebody who doesn't have that participatory knowing. You're going to have to find ways to reach out to things with which they do have participatory knowing so that you can communicate. So you need to understand how the different, um, you have to understand how the different um, types of knowing operate, okay? So just because you have a good proposition does not mean that it's pointing at something that, that happened well there. Let me get this back in, let me get this back in order. <clears throat> so what's happening here? You, um, let me make a new slide. How does, how does something like provisionism happen? Okay. How does provisionism, how do provisionism statements get uh, generated? Let's ask that. How do provisionism statements get generated? So I'm going to put this up here and make this big so that you can see it, hopefully. And we're gonna do this together. Provisionism statements get generated by um, a presumably <laughs> smart person optimizing to state something clearly. And also solve a problem. Um, a presumably smart person optimizing to, you could say optimizing to do these things. Or you could say person persons. Optimizing to, and we're going to put a colon there, and then we're going to say <clears throat> state something clearly and also solve a problem. What is that problem? Okay. Optimizing to generate a system of statements that is not Calvinism, something like that, or that opposes Calvinism, something like that. Generate a statement, a system of propositions, put it that way, that can be scaled and taught to others uh, easily. Now, what's the problem here? What's the problem here? <clears throat> That's the problem. That's the problem. This person who is doing this, a presumably smart person is optimizing to state something clearly. Is that easy to do? No, it's not easy to do. To solve a problem, is that easy to do? No, it's not easy to do. To generate a system of statements that is not Calvinism, is that easy to do? It's not exactly easy to do. So now I'm going to generate a system of propositions that can be scaled and taught to others easily. Now, can those people being taught do what the first guy did? And if they can't, that is a problem. Now, here's what happens. These guys, those people who are being taught, they didn't do any of this work. You see? They didn't do any of this work up here. They didn't generate any of the systems. They didn't do any of the work. They're not, they didn't do any of that. All they got taught was a set of statements to learn to avoid Calvinism, and they know that they want to avoid Calvinism. Now, here, let's take these statements. Now the next thing, what do they do next? They impose apologetics, apologetics onto what they 
learned, thus doing epistemology backwards. So only this guy, wherever this generated from, only this guy did any epistemology to get to the statements of provisionism. He's the only one that did that. Okay? The rest of the people who are exposed to those statements, none of them did that. Now, I know they will disagree. Oh, well, I didn't. No, you didn't. You did not do that. As a matter of fact, I have a slide to show you what you did. And then you do, after you're exposed to the statements, you are satisfied that this is a set of semantically disambiguated statements that is a good alternative to Calvinism. And so, therefore, since I'm satisfied for that, I will accept this and affirm this and emotionally relate to this, and now I will backwards learn all the epistemological things that I need to know in order to defend it. That's, that's the problem with apologetics. I have, I have a video why, <coughs> why apologetics is all backwards. I have no problem, listen, listen, I have no problem with this guy defending provisionism. I have a big problem with these people defending provisionism. You understand the difference there? Because they didn't do the work to get to provisionism in the first place. And so they are reverse engineering arguments back into uh, statements that were accepted that were non, with, with no epistemic warranty for being accepted. They're just happy that they have a degree of certainty that they can assign to their non-Calvinism. That's, that's what satisfies them. And they're very happy for somebody else to do the work. But look, you got to do the work. So that's, that's that. So we're not necessarily just like this statement, just like this statement that this damsel is making. She's not making a wrong statement. And this guy who generated the system, even the guy who generated this system, they might not necessarily be saying anything wrong. But the fact that they are taking all those propositions and scaling them down to people who aren't expected to do that work, you're creating NPCs when you do that. And it doesn't matter if you're creating NPCs who are repeating true things. The repetition of a true statement is not a valid human enterprise. Carl Jung said, beware of unearned wisdom. And when you have a and when you have an entire system that tries to uh, scale and project statements onto a, another group of people that did not earn that does not have they don't embody the wisdom to generate those statements themselves, that is a big, big problem. It's a big, big problem. Now, uh, Jordan Peterson was talking to Ian McGilchrist about a guy with OCD. And this is interesting. He was talking to him about a guy with OCD was asking Jordan Peterson, hey, how do you, when you see a newspaper sitting at the train station that somebody else has read, how do you decide whether or not to pick that up? How do you decide, like, because a lot of OCD people, we just had a video on OCD recently, by the way, so look that up if you want more information on OCD and Christians. But it just so happens, you know, synchronicities, right? Um, somebody was asking Jordan Peterson this, and he's like, <laughs> somebody said, Carl Jung, a Gnostic, look, um, you guys are going to have to stop mapping everything. You, you stop committing the genetic fallacy when you hear statements. Assess statements for the for what they are themselves, okay? And don't try to map everything back to the genetic fallacy is when you this guy says this. A genetic fallacy is when you okay, the guy is bad in some way, therefore everything that he says is bad. Um, and somebody says Carl Jung presents the wisdom of the world, not of God. Carl Jung was a professing Christian, okay? But just look at the statement. Look at the statement itself. Beware of unearned wisdom. 
Now, what I should have done for you people here, for you guys, I, I should have just not attributed the quote because likely, perhaps, you're, you're, what you're telling me here is that you're not at the, at the mental or human developmental stage where you can uh, non-NPC discern the veracity of a quote, okay? Now, what you're doing is you're acting like an NPC here. You're trying to map the origin of the quote back to something bad and you can't just look at the quote itself. I don't have a problem taking a quote from James White if it's a good quote or John MacArthur if it's a good quote and take that and separate the signal from the noise. I don't have a problem with that and you need to learn how to not have a problem with that. All right? You need to get that. So Jordan Peterson is talking to Ian McGilchrist about uh, somebody who had OCD and they're like, hey, how do you know when, when it's okay to pick up a newspaper that you see sitting around at a train station? Obviously, if it's like got, if it's soiled and wet and looks like it's got junk or mold all over, you're not going to pick it up. But there might be one sitting around that you, you might think is okay to pick up, but an OCD person doesn't know how, how a non-OCD person assesses that. And in response to that, now, Jordan Peterson makes this statement. I'm going to show you a video clip. It's a very short video clip. It's a minute, 30 seconds. I want you to listen to this very carefully. But I want you to listen very carefully to what Ian McGilchrist says next. And I want you to apply it to the concept of statements of faith found within Christianity. That's what I want you to apply it to. Okay? So listen very carefully. Yeah. And the answer is, I have no idea how I know whether or not that newspaper or magazine that's been sitting there and abandoned by someone is an object that I would be willing to pick up, but I can more or less tell at a glance. No, no, it's a misconception that um, when we make things explicit, um, we're closer to the truth. Because often what we do when we make things explicit is that we conflate uh, half a dozen or more different considerations that our intuitive and unconscious minds are able to weigh remarkably effectively. We substitute for that um, holistic vision a single thing that it collapses into the explicit statement that we make. And so all the time that you're having to make explicit what you would do under what circumstances, why, you're limiting the world. You're, you're driving it down and down to, to less and less meaning. And w one of the things that amused me, because I had, of course, patients with OCD as well, was that I had one particular one uh, who was a philosopher, and he said that when he was studying Anglo-American analytic philosophy, his OCD got terrifically bad. But when he was studying phenomenological philosophy, uh, his OCD relaxed, and he was able to see things in a much broader, wider, and, and more uh, sustainable and coherent way. So I thought that was a, a nice uh, sidelight on this uh, question. Yeah. And the answer is, I have... So and that the video is looping and starting over. So let's, um, I want to hear what um, Ian McGilchrist says again right at the beginning. Now, they went on to talk about something about context, too. You, you have loss of context in these propositions. Okay? Be willing to pick up, but I can more or less tell at a glance. No, no, it's a misconception that um, when we make things explicit, um, we're closer to the truth. Because often what we do when we make things explicit is that we conflate uh, half a dozen or more different considerations that our intuitive and unconscious minds are able to weigh remarkably effectively. We substitute for that um, holistic vision a single thing that it collapses into the explicit statement that we make. And so it's a mistake. It's a mistake to think that when we make an explicit statement, when we make something explicit, that we're closer to the truth. That is a huge mistake that we make. We have all these statements of faith out there. We think we are getting closer to the truth, and we are actually getting further from the truth because when you make something explicit, you're losing many other things that are happening by which you assess whether or not something is true and you're collapsing, you're collapsing them all down into one. So then all the NPCs, 
that Calvinism, provisionism, and free grace theology and Arminianism are producing, they are they have they are taking away the calibration of all their tacit knowledge, all their presuppositions, and uh, all their intuitions and senses and feelings, and and many other things that are going on. They're taking all that away and they're reducing it down to a black or white statement of what is or what is not so. And that is not how anything else in the world operates. And that is, that is also the tyranny of the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere, the left hemisphere of your mind, is constantly desiring to construct a model of reality. But the problem is that model of reality is not, that's a map of reality, and it is, it starts to lead the way for us. Whereas the right hemisphere is more uh, aware, is more holistically aware of the environment and able to take in new information and update the model. So it's important that the left hemisphere that's constantly trying to systematize things is subordinate to the right hemisphere, which is able to bring in new information to make that system more functional and more corresponding with reality, okay? So it's important that the right hemisphere is more in, in control. I highly recommend if you, I was going to say if you are a Christian who wants to, if you are anybody who wants to grow and transform and be better, I highly recommend Dr. Ian McGillchrist's work on the, uh, the Master and His Emissary. And he's got a new book coming out, which is prohibitively long, but we are at the place and time in Christianity where Christians are going to have to start putting forth the effort to educate themselves to be better. We have to be better. We have to transform into something that is better than what we are now. We have to. We don't have a choice. The church of the future that will do any good for the sake of the kingdom of God is going to be in the edification model of Ephesians 4.16. And what that means is that every individual, every joint supply, everybody has to bring something to the table. You have to show up. My wife and I were just talking last night about relationships, about husband and wife relationships, you know, that kind of thing. And we were saying how that when you are selecting a mate, it's important that you know what your own value is. And it's also important that you understand what your expectations are like that other person needs to bring something to the table. The edification model of Christianity of what should be happening. It, it has to be something where more people are bringing more things to the table. You need to come to the table with a lot more understanding under your belt than what people are used to. People are, people are, they're just spitting out all this doctrinal stuff. Somebody in the comments right here, they said, what did you have that you did not receive? And, and that's kind of what they, what are they thinking? They're thinking, they are thinking, Ben Ray here it, is kind of thinking, well, I got all these propositions from somebody and I just had to receive them from somewhere. What I'm trying to tell you, Ben Ray, is that the things that you need to be receiving need to not be just empty propositions. They need to be, what, you, what we need to be passing down is procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing. Those are the things that you need to be having that you received, not just propositions. That's what needs to happen. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Now, on this channel, we talk about we talk about mental illness. We talked about OCD recently, and we have a lot of people in the comments sections trying to map, like, well, how do we know it's not just demons? Let me tell you what. My entire life, my entire life of thinking that certain mental illnesses was just a result of demons and sin and it could be overcome with pr <clears throat> prayer and spirituality and discipline and and those in churchy churchy type stuff sunday school answers that ruined my life and negatively affected my kids which will affect them for the rest of their lives not knowing this stuff it is not just demons and sin and prayer that's not what the stuff boils down to and what you need to be concerned with, if you want to map something to demons, the thing, huh, if you want to look at a, a spirit possessed, a, a, like a damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, don't be thinking 
borderline personality disorder and OCD and things like that, a spirit of divination, okay? What you need to be thinking of, more, what is closer, if you want to attribute something to demons, is ideological possession. Ideological possession. When somebody becomes an ideologue, what does it mean when somebody becomes an ideologue? When someone has a set of ideas and they envision a perfect world where that set of ideas is embraced by everybody and they are willing to go to extreme measures or they are willing for somebody else to enforce extreme measures to bring that reality to pass. And it, the, the, the ideology, whether or not something is an ideology, does not matter what the content of the ideology is. It could be Christian. It could be atheism. It could be Islamic. It, could be, it doesn't matter what it is. It, does, it really doesn't matter. It could be global warming. could be anti-abortion. could be pro-abortion. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything can be an ideology. Um, if you are pro-life, for example, maybe you're not an ideologue. But the guy who blows up abortion clinics is an ideologue, okay? And I'm, I'm not saying you have to be that extreme in order to be an ideologue, but I'm trying to give you a very clear example, a very clear and obvious example. If you want to, under, if you want to map something to demons and demon possession, you need to start looking at ideology, not mental illness, okay? Your, your body has to function a certain way. There's all kinds of things that can be out of sorts like your liver and your gallbladder. Not long ago, I had to have my gallbladder removed, okay? Sometimes things don't function right. Sometimes in the mind, things don't function right. You can have neural pathways physiologically rearranged in ways that you wish they weren't by things like trauma, by things like your upbringing, things like that can really happen. So becoming educated about how the mind works and how you can uh, maximize neuroplasticity to make your own future better is what you should be focusing on rather than just consigning it all to demons, okay? You need to become educated on stuff like that. If you want to consign something to demons, you need to think in the realm of ideology, not in the realm of mental illness, okay? Look at this, for example. I, I reworded a couple things. Now, over here, it says spirit of divination, and over here, it says soothsaying. You know what soothsaying is? Soothsaying is in an archaic English phrase, and all it means is truth saying. That's all it means, okay? Now, the only reason we have a negative connotation for a spirit of divination is because all throughout Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we're told not to have familiar spirits, not to, not to do divining, those kinds of things. We're told uh, that those things are bad. There are many people who are who were not biblically literate in the past, and I'm not going to mention their names because I've seen the kind of people we have in the comment section right now, who were very smart and attributed their, their smarts, if you will, or their wisdom to the presence of a demon or a daemon. Now, we have a negative connotation on that word, but the way it was used at the time was a neutral thing. Like you could have... Uh, maybe like some people think that Tesla had access to the Akashic record. They're one of the most, one of the best, naturally best mathematicians was an Indian guy who didn't have any formal training, but they think that he had access to the Akashic record, something like that. Access to something that is beyond yourself, and that's the word for it. And the way it's used is is neutral, and as as it was used by some of those people. Now, when I was a kid. We used to have these books about like, it was about Johnny Appleseed and Thomas Jefferson and all kinds of things. And they were called value tales. And they were, they were kids books. And they were like cartoon versions of like the story of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln or anybody else pretty much in Americana history, right? And in these books, you would have, there would be like a Disney movie. You know how Pinocchio has this cricket, Jiminy Cricket following him around? Uh, these like Johnny Appleseeds, I think his pot talked to him and somebody else's shoes talked to him. There's always some kind of inanimate object that was alive and or was depicted as having consciousness and dialoguing with the main character in these little cartoon books, right, for kids. And the church that I was at preached, they came to our house 
just as a visit, the pastor comes to the house, saw those books, and then later we got a sermon against them because it was promoting demonology. <laughs> uh, a lot of, uh, this part isn't different, I'm just highlighting it though, a lot of, uh, a lot of pain in my life due to stupid things like that that occurred in my life. That's by no means the worst one. Maybe one day I'll tell the stories of the ones that really bother me. About how ideology caused uh, my parents and then later me to make really bad decisions. So what I've done here is I've changed this. So this is not the King James. This is I'm saying this by way of paraphrasing commentary. So I'm going to write commentary up here. Right? I'm not saying this is scripture. What am I saying? I want you to consider this. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. And you might be thinking, oh, a spirit of divination. Maybe that's people with schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder, etc. and so forth, and OCD and, and cluster B personality, all that kind of stuff. No. Here's what I want you to think. And then much gained by soothsaying. Well, we understand that soothsaying simply means truth telling. So, um, I was talking with somebody recently and their impression was that, well, obviously she's a con artist because nobody can tell the future. It's like these palm readers in New Orleans who you pay them their money and they tell you this stuff and it's kind of fun, but you're not really making the money. No, it says it, there's nothing in the text that says whether or not what she said to all the people, but how, how they made their money. There's nothing in the text that says whether that was right or wrong, but if you're making a lot of money off of it, I would presume that she did have a spirit of divination that really was telling the truth. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how I take it. In other words, you could meet somebody and say, hey, next Tuesday your crops are going to fail. Whatever, something like that. I don't know. You're going to... But so here's how I'm encouraging you to think about this. A certain damsel possessed with a certain ideology met us. Why is that the same? Because if she had her stuff from a spirit of divination, she just had it handed to her from this spirit. What's going on? She doesn't have any procedural knowing behind what she's saying. She doesn't have any perspectival knowing. She doesn't have any participatory knowing. She's getting it from a spirit. It's not wisdom that she is embodying. It's wisdom that she's getting supernaturally from somewhere else. And it, whether you get the wisdom supernaturally or whether you get it because this guy taught you to repeat after me, I'm going to teach you not how to think, but what to think. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. You're still missing the real kinds of knowing. So when I hear somebody repeating what somebody like this says, and it doesn't have to be provisionism. You can fill in the blank with free grace, Arminianism, Calvinism, fill in with anything you want. Doesn't matter. Global warming agenda, abortion, whatever you want to put there. You can put anything you want there. Okay? Doesn't matter. When those people are repeating, repeat after me, I'm going to tell you what to think, not how to think. They are saying things, they're emitting propositions, data compression of procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing that does not exist in that person. They're repeating somebody else's. They're passing along somebody else's procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing if what they happen to be repeating happens to be true. If it's true. Now, they could just be saying things that don't correspond with any reality whatsoever. So when somebody says something, it's not just whether or not it's true. It's whether or not that person saying it embodies the wisdom that warrants them saying it. You see? You see the difference? That's what you need to get to. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So they brought us much broader masters much gain by truth telling. So what can you do? You can be possessed with a certain ideology. And you can make a bunch of propositional statements. You can repeat everything somebody like this. They did all the work. 
and you can build a mega church and make a whole bunch of money by repeating true things that somebody else works to reach those conclusions. Now, when I hear somebody doing that, you can kind of hear, you can kind of hear if somebody has actually been to the top of the mountain and seen the view or whether they're just repeating descriptions they heard from other people that have been to the top of the mountain and seen the view. So when they do that, when they repeat those descriptions of other people, those descriptions might not be wrong, but you can kind of tell they're not theirs. You see, they've never seen. They've never been to the top of the mountain. They've never seen the view from the top of the mountain. They're just repeating what people are saying who have been to the top of the mountain say. So maybe, maybe this guy has been to the top of the mountain and he has seen. These guys who are being taught this should shut their mouth until they also get to the top of the mountain. And hold everything, suspend judgment on everything they hear until they get to the top of the mountain. Don't just repeat the stuff. Don't repeat the stuff. When you repeat the stuff, you are possessed by a certain ideology. That it, it's not your ideology. Another thing somebody smart said that I won't quote because we don't have, uh, we have some uh, l low developmental status people here in the, in the chat section. Is that... People don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And I actually have, in another video, I have two people quoting that. So you can't, you know, you can, maybe you can map one of them to being a Gnostic, but not the other one. All right. But I'm sure you would try if I gave you their name. But, but the fact is, it happens to bear out in reality. It happens when, when you pass along, when you tell people what to think, instead of teaching them how to think. So when you teach people how to think, it necessarily indicates that you withhold what you think they should think. For example, I've been, I've, I've been like an eternal security person all my life. I have now learned to not teach eternal security, but teach people epistemology and biblical interpretation and when they ask me questions on eternal security give non-committal answers why because they need to get there themselves and not be pressured by me for what they should think maybe they respect me and me telling them what i think is one of the biggest damages i can do to them developing uh their own sense making skills rather than outsourcing their sense making to what i think so we need to learn how to do this kind of thing. So when you are possessed with an ideology, you do not believe. So these guys who are being taught do not believe the things for the same reason this guy does. They may be saying the same things the same way a broken clock is right twice a day. They may be saying the same things, but they're not saying them for the same reasons. This guy at the top, Whoever generated provisionism might be saying the provisionism things for all the good reasons that you would find over here on the left. Epistemic ranking criteria. Um, a transparent process for information derivation. Axiomatic awareness. Axiomatic minimalism. Establishing connectivity to agreed upon evidence with sound process for interpreting the evidence. Addressing the evidence directly. Internal coherence, external coherence, non-contradiction, grammar, not mixing moral implications, levels of certainty calibrated and associated with proper epistemic basis, curiosity, exploring mode, not, uh, not with certainty and persuasion mode, clearly established disconfirmation criteria, accounting for how the mind works, um, distributed cognition, multi-perspectival awareness, lack of need to personally commit a set of pro to personally commit to a set of propositions. This person may have done all that stuff. These people, if they are taught what this person arrived at that way, they do not believe those same conclusions for those same reasons. So just repeating the same conclusions that you think happen to be true does not mean you embody the wisdom to say those things. And you should keep your mouth shut until you do. Now these people, why do these people believe those things? Same things. They believe them for these reasons. On the right hand side, they had their values appealed to, they catalyzed their emotions. 
um, play to their intuitions. Self-deprecation plays into uh, your value system. Um, get you to let your guard down. In-group status solidification, peer pressure. In-group ranking advantage. Presuppositional vulnerabilities that you have. I need to defeat Calvinism. And I, and I need the certainty to defeat Calvinism. Well, that need to defeat Calvinism can, call you, can cause you to turn into an NPC by propositions that somebody else worked for and you didn't. Mentor approval. In-group approval acceptance. Again, more peer pressure stuff. Positive response promoting. Why do I have so many? Prompting. Positive response prompting. When, uh, when I used to sell rainbow vacuum cleaners, they taught us to ask questions and nod your head because people have mirror neuron responses in their head and they taught us this. They have mirror neuron responses just like a cat does. If you do something with a cat, they will mimic you sometimes. And if you say, isn't cleaner air something that you would like to have in your home? You see, they will nod with you. Yes, I would like to have cleaner air in my home. And it just so happens that clean air, who's going to object to clean air? But what well, we're going to ask a series of questions like that, and then we're going to get them nodding their head every time. And by the time we get to the end, and we're like, don't you think this is worth $4,000? They're going to be like, uh-huh. That, that's what, see, it's, you know, we're, we're creating response inertia in the person's mind as we go through the sales pitch, okay? And that's what happens. Uh, juxtaposition. With a bad opposite. Well, you don't want to be a Pelagian, do you? You don't want to be an Arminian. You don't, you, you don't want to exalt man and think that you save yourself, do you? Right? They, they'll pigeonhole you. Unstated motivations. Propaganda techniques. Persuasion motivation. Rivalrous dynamic. Uh... We're going to debate this. Now you want to win instead of wanting to find the truth. I want to, I want to have a semantically disambiguated system that can outcompete James White's. Well, see, when you're thinking, you can't optimize to outcompete and to find the truth. You can't do both. You cannot do both at the same time. You think you can, you cannot, okay? Um, limbic hijacking, your emotional system, getting your emotions all worked up for or against something that you love or hate. Othering people, us and them, stigmatizing, outgrouping, um, unstated implications, propositional certainty, moral accusations for disagreement. So even though this guy may have arrived at his conclusions in a very good way, the way those ideas get transmitted to these people when they are finished affirming and believing in provisionism or free grace or Arminianism or whatever the non-Calvinist thing is that they're optimizing for, they believe them... <laughs> So many typos. I feel like a complete remedial person. They believe those things for these reasons, not for these reasons, like the founder. You see the difference? I d we don't need people who are possessed with a set of ideas who believe them for these reasons. Which, if, if you are an ism or an ist or a whatever, that's why you believe things. Not because of anything epistemically sound. If you are a Calvinist, you did not generate Calvinism. You believe Calvinism for these reasons. If you are a provisionist and you affirm all of provisionism, you are provisionist for the reasons on the right, not the reasons on the left. Unless you wrote the statements yourself and, and came to those yourself before being exposed to them. Now, by the time you've been exposed to them, you've been told what to think, you've been pressured into what to think, and then all of your research that you think you did to confirm all those statements, well, I know you're arguing at the screen right now. No, 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 I did my own research, and I, and I can't, no, no, you didn't. You didn't. You have confirmation bias after you heard those things, and you're affected by all those things on the right. That's what happened. I don't care how much you argue with me. I don't care how much you disagree with me. That's what's going on. Now, I wanted to talk about a wisdom component to this, too. But, so, what I really want you to do is I want you to understand how just because somebody says something that happens to be true does not mean 
that you want it coming from that source. You don't want it coming from an NPC. Okay? If I want people to say true things, what I need to do is I need to instill in them the participatory, perspectival, and procedural knowing. How do you come to good conclusions? Don't tell them what those conclusions are because as soon as you do, you poison the well. As soon as you do, you poison the well. If somebody respects me and what I have to say, as soon as I tell them that I'm biased toward eternal security, it affects their bias and it negatively influences their ability to do good procedural knowing in the area of hermeneutics and epistemics and arrive at a good conclusion, which when they do, might give me some correction on my position, which I didn't anticipate getting. So it's not only good for them, it's good for me to not influence them with my conclusions a priori. Now what I wanted to do is talk about the wisdom aspect of this too. What do you mean the wisdom aspect of this? The, um, and I've, I've been talking with uh, Nick a little bit about this, and he brought this out. The same followed Paul and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. This, this grieved Paul. Now, if you look at the larger what it said, her masters saw that their hope of gains was gone. And this damsel that was possessed with the spirit of divination brought her masters much gain by soothing. So masters. So apparently it sounds like there's a group of people who own her, maybe like a slave or like an endangered servant or something like that. And they are making money off her. They're, they're pimping out her soothsaying abilities for money. Okay. Now, another way to look at this, if, if I take this as a pattern, we don't know, we don't have any indication that she's saying false things. She just has a spirit of divination. We're not even told that's good or bad in this text. Now, I know you can infer that it's bad from other passages. And then soothsaying just means truth saying. And then whenever the one thing we do hear her say happens to be the truth happens to be the truth now you wouldn't want an endorsement from the pharisees if you were jesus right if like on this channel i don't want an endorsement from calvinists i don't want i don't want james white to approve of what i'm saying here so if james white were to go on tomorrow and say kevin thompson's a really great guy he's got a great channel you need to listen to that channel i would wonder what i'm doing wrong and I would be grieved that he is in approval of what I'm doing here. All right? Because I don't, I don't want uh, people who represent wrong things or getting their information from bad places to approve of what I'm doing. It very much, I very much want disapproval from people who are like from, from the Pharisees and the scribes. And I, I very much want public disapproval from people like that because we're not on the same channel. And as soon as people like that start to approve of what I'm doing, People who are a part of the establishment start to approve of what I'm doing. That's a problem. That's a problem. So you don't want people like this being in approval of what you are doing. But anyway, um, I'm going to give you a different twist on this. I'm going to give you a taste of this, and then we're going to quit for today. And maybe look at a few comments, but I don't know if I'm feeling comments right now. Uh -huh. In the Bible, wisdom is personified as a woman. In Proverbs 8, she's personified as a woman. And um, Nick has mentioned on our Wednesday night sessions a few times how um, the, the Disney cartoon Hunchback of Notre Dame does a remarkably uh, refined job of presenting wisdom as a woman and embodied in the character of Esmeralda. Okay. And it does it at the beginning with a different woman. And, uh, it's, it's very profound. I can't wait until we collect all his thoughts, put them in a video and make the, like he releases the video of his thoughts on this because it's amazing. And if you look at it this way, what tends to happen is people want to own wisdom they want to be the master of wisdom. They want to have wisdom at their disposal 
and they want to be able to dispense it in a in a greedy self gaining way and that is an improper relationship so wisdom it's important to keep wisdom in a proper relationship with love and agape rather than self servitude of greed and what happens is people get people get wisdom from maybe somebody like this maybe the founder of the ism maybe that's a wise dude maybe what he said um is indicative of the embodiment of wisdom in him but people are then going to take they're going to try to be the master of that wisdom they're going to systematize it and what are they going to do next they're going to try how can i capture this wisdom and make money off of it so if there's a lot of people who think there's truth in christianity if i'm trying to make money you know what i'm going to do if i can't if uh if my songwriting isn't doing too well in the rock and pop or country genres or something like that i might i might swap over and make merchandise of the christians using feigned words Second Peter 2, by the way, is what I'm referring to when I say that. I might fake Christianity in the form of music to get people to buy it so I can make money. So maybe there is wisdom in Christianity. And if I can put that in song form and make it entertaining and put it in a way that people will buy it, I can use that for my own greedy, selfish purposes. Not because I care about them or I'm trying to increase their spirituality or connectedness to God and maybe somebody can take that and actually increase their spirituality or connectedness to God by taking something that was um, put forth with bad motives like that but um, that is the misuse of wisdom when that kind of thing happens so people are there's, I'm, there's not necessarily anything wrong with a mega church or a huge church but when people are maximizing on an administrative model while employing a body of wisdom that is not theirs for the sake of making money. That's that's not good, <laughs> to, to say the least. The understatement of the century. Maybe, maybe I can have Nick come on next Sunday and talk about this concept with me because I think that's very good. I want to, I want to develop that a little bit further. So uh, if you're out there listening right now, be prepared for some emails from me on that, Nick. All right. Let me see. Let me see what some of these comments say. Uh, all the members of the body of Christ are needed or the body is lacking. Paul states this very clearly. Yes, indeed. Everybody's got to bring something to the table. Uh, we need to transform as long as we're holding on to an ism. We'll never move forward with what the Lord has for us because our mind is limited to the bounds of the proposition. Yes, indeed. If they want 10 years experience and I have none, I just watch two or three YouTube videos about it, then I'm good to go. That's kind of funny because I'm constantly watching YouTube videos to fix things around the house or to fix something on the car or to... Uh, I watched a YouTube video to uh, change the window out in the sliding door of a van that I had. And then I, I wound up, it, it took the dude on the video like five minutes or maybe 15. And it took me about three days. <laughs> I cut my arms up pretty good. I think the point is that the wisdom is given and received then it is not earned. Yeah, each individual needs to have a relationship with wisdom. You need to dance and tango with wisdom yourself. Um, ditto, Kevin. It messes us up big time. Peter is not looking hard. That statement is wrong. Um, good day, everyone. And by the way, wisdom is not something you can transmit in propositions. You can't. Um, wisdom is like... I have this little, let's see if that'll show better, there we go. I have this little slide where that at the bottom, it's supposed to be moving. Let me see if I can get the move there. It's moving now. It's supposed to, that's, that's a little thing from Knight Rider. So wisdom would be constantly 
in a flow state of moving back and forth between all four kinds of knowing all the time. I did not say leave out propositional. I said all four kinds of knowing all the time. Understanding that you are leading the way with participatory knowing and then perspectival and procedural and then propositional knowing is the most shallow kind of knowing, but it is also the currency of knowing and how we transmit knowledge to other people or how we communicate it and package it to other people. All right. So you cannot sense wisdom necessitates moving back and forth between all four kinds of knowing fluidly at all times. You necessarily cannot pass it on in propositional form. You can't because that's just one kind of knowing. So you have to have some kind of guildcraft thing where when you're teaching people, this doesn't scale well, but when you're teaching people, they need to be getting experience, participatory understanding, perspectival and procedural as they go, not just propositional. Uh, That doesn't scale well, which makes it very difficult, but that's absolutely essential in order for people to actually grow in wisdom. What scales well? Telling people a bunch of propositions of what they're supposed to believe scales very well and is very tempting for us to eat the tree of that fruit because we think we think it brings us knowledge and it really doesn't. It really doesn't. That's a huge temptation because it scales well. Because I can put, you know, three thousand people in seminary and in four years pop them out all preaching and teaching the things that I think are true. But they're all, they're all that damsel with the spirit of divination. That's what they all are. None of them got that wisdom themselves. So getting the wisdom yourself does not scale well. It is hard work. Everybody's got to go to the gym, okay? You can't just pump steroids into everybody. It's not the same thing. What else do we have here? I'm basically just going to scroll through and see if I have anything that jumps out to me. Or maybe see if, uh, okay, beyond the fundamentals, are you saying that truth statements don't mean much without experience or knowledge behind the statement when opposing someone? Uh, When opposing someone indicates a rivalrous dynamic, and that's something you would want to avoid in the first place together at all. I recommend that when you're dealing with somebody who you think is wrong, that you find a way to gently lead them to the next rung on their ladder of transformation and don't necessarily try to bring them to any particular propositional conclusion at the time because you're going to be doing more harm than good when you do that. Um, what else do we have here? Yes, um, not, not man's wisdom. We got a super chat from Jamie Russell. God bless you. Thank you, Jamie Russell. I appreciate that. How do you truly learn of like spirits, bad kind? or uh, I have a whole other video on that. Another one, a sparkling diamond, Jamie Russell. Thanks for the super chat. All super chats, I try to guarantee that they will all be read and acknowledged and or acknowledged. If you ask a question in a super chat, I will answer it unless you ask it right after we go offline, something like that. But then I'll try to pick it up on the next one. This is how you end up with Calvinists that are more zealous Calvinists than Calvin, or any ist more zealous than the progenitor of the ism. Yes. And so the problem, what I'm trying to do is get you, when when I'm dealing with these isms and stuff, going tit for tat against Calvinism sells well. Okay? Doing provisionism against Calvinism gives people the answers they need to maybe win some debates at the church that they're having or solve the problem of their family being split up by Calvinism. But the problem is it's dealing with the symptom, not the root problem. Okay, It's mopping up the floor. Provisionism mops the mess off the floor, but it doesn't fix the leaky plumbing. Okay, It puts a Band-Aid on the skint knee, but it doesn't teach you how to ride your bike any better. That's what provisionism does. Provisionism, free grace, because they don't get to the root of the problem, they are essentially bastard children of Calvinism itself. Okay, They are to Calvinism what Calvinism is to Catholicism. Um, C- Calvinism is a bastard child of Catholicism. And then these other isms that don't address the root problem with the, ideolo- with the ideological way, 
they are just the bastard children of other ideologies. They're making lateral moves, and you're going to have this exponential unfolding of other isms and other isms, which keep trying to semantically dis disambiguate till you find the other oppositional rivalrous thing, and that's never, ever going to work. It's never, ever going to work. You have to become metaparadigmatic, except you repent. Metacognition. You will all likewise perish. I know I'm really behind, but Jordan Peterson was talking about a guy with autism. Okay, he might have been talking about a guy with autism, but um, then Ian McGilchrist spoke about a guy with OCD. And that's that may have made a mistake in who was talking about what there. Um, are you saying smashing atheists and getting followers isn't doing anything for God? When you're dealing with an atheist... I just came up with a definition for atheism the other day, and it is essentially somebody who is in stage three of development, like James Fowler's stage three of development, who recognizes the problem with the mythopoetic uh, narrative of stage three synthetic uh, conventional faith, but uh, while denying that, stays in stage three themselves, Okay. So what you want to do with an atheist is not just refute the propositions that they are attaching themselves to, but figure out how to get them out of stage three. And it's going to take probably a, a growth crisis, a growth prompting crisis to do that. So that's what you want to do with an atheist, because they're not going to be able to take anything that you're saying uh, very well until they can come out of stage three. All right. And that's that's where you want everybody. Everybody who's in stage three, you want them to you want to get them to stage four, okay? Uh, and that's one of the things that you need to bring to the table. You need to read that book too. Everybody. Don't hold on to any isms, just reformed theology and the doctrine and grace. That's that's such a such a stupid thing to say. Because Calvinism, okay? And and there is no grace in Calvinism. We have to ask ourselves, why do I believe what I believe? Why? Not because so. If you're asking yourself why you believe what you believe, you need to stop believing it. Just stop right there and stop believing it. Stop affirming it. And then start assessing what you believe based on your experience and uh, interaction with Scripture and moving forward from there. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, stop believing it. And then stop saying it. Um, what else do we have? We got to quit here. We're way over time. Um, Jamie Russell, thanks for the another, another super chat. Real men admit mistakes for the sake of others. Uh, Ray, haven't we seen this lately? What else do we have? Basically, I'm going to scroll through and see if we have any. See if we have any super chats, really, because I don't want those to go unrecognized. Um, all right, so thanks for that. And we're going to stop right there. So today was kind of, a, it was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. I know we went a little long today, but uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoy this kind of content, remember it's important to support the channel. We can't do this without you. And the details to do that are in the description below the video. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.